been looking back along this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. There's no better way to tell you. Than to say, God's been good in my had some bitter years, but I felt His arms around me as I faced my greatest fears. You see, I've had more gains than losses, and I've known more joy than hurt as His grace. Rolled down upon me, undeserved. For God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times. I wouldn't change them if I could, 'cause through it all, God's been good. For God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. I could spend. Trying to tell you everything he is, but the best way that I can say it is this: Oh, God's been.
Testing one, two, three. 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 Can you hear me today? Amen. I will rise and go to Jesus. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Is my mic sounding okay? All right, all right, it's time. John only had a pat all the things he saw. Four horsemen they were riding. To bring the wrath of God. God The wine press of the nations In judgment bringing pain You think you've seen the worst down uh, uh, uh. here It's, it's gonna, gonna change. change God's holy lamb and power Is vesture in blood. blood He's coming with the rope and wipe Those who've overcome They'll cry for rocks and mountains to fall and hide their face. But that won't stop the plan of God. It's, it's gonna, gonna change. change. It's, gonna it's gonna change. change. It's coming from above. The King, the King of, of Kings, Kings is, is coming, coming back and, and the devil's, devil's on the run. Where when the world has turned the page. Get your house in order now. Amen. It's gonna change. Well, now, now it's gonna change. Come on, Lord. Come get us. It's gonna change. It's coming, coming from, from above. above. The King, King of Kings, Kings is, is coming back, back and the devil's on the run. Where will you be when the world has turned the page? Get your house, house in order, order now. now. It's gonna change. Amen. Oh, it's gonna change. Amen, amen. Let's go. Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good afternoon. Whoa. Amen. (laughs) Let's do that again. Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good afternoon, everybody. Happy Cyber Monday to you. 
Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast. Our topic today, we're asking a question. What will happen when the next Trump presidency and the American police state meet head on? And what if they don't? For anybody who's paid even a marginal amount of attention over the last eight years, you know that America has become a severely fractured and tribal nation, where there is a different administration of justice based on your political leanings, ideologies, and what you say on social media. Biden and Trump both mishandle documents, yet only one is punished. J6 participants are jailed while BLM adjutants who burn buildings and killed people walk free. The cop who killed George Floyd has just been stabbed nearly to death in his jail cell, while the cop who killed Ashley Babbitt had a secret trial, was let go scot-free, and is praised by the left. I bet you don't even know his name. And that's intentional. In America in 2023, if you know the right people, you can commit crimes at will. This is America today, and it's about to get a whole lot worse in 2024. Psalms 19 verse 7, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. On this episode, the land of the free has become decidedly less free, much less free. This article that you're reading right now is sitting on a website that has been branded as a extremist organization by the U.S. Cyber Command. Donald Trump ran for president with a vow to drain the swamp, and he did not fulfill that promise. In fact, the very swamp he vowed to drain now has him pinned to the wall, facing 91 felony counts in Washington, New York, Florida, and Georgia. It'll be a miracle if he manages to stay out of jail, let alone become the 47th president of the United States. But what if he does? What would a Trump presidency look like when the Donald uses his administration to get revenge the exact same way the Biden administration is doing to him right now? What happens to America at that point? Today, we show you how much the swamp has grown, how deep the deep state has become, and what the future of America might look like when we run it through the filter of your King James Bible. All this and updates on Hamas, the hostages, and everything else that you need to know on this Cyber Monday Prophecy Podcast. Um, Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask... Uh, For his blessing on today's program, Heavenly Father, we ask you to work and move and um, lead and guide, Father. Uh, Today we pray for lost souls. Uh, Adam and Katie are asking prayer for their neighbors, Jason, Eddie, and Brian. Loretta Oates is asking salvation prayer for her sons, Kenny and Matthew. Jane is asking salvation prayer for her son, Troy. Julie Lynn praying for Katie Ann. Chona would like salvation prayer for Estefano Jr., Eugenia, and her kids, Maricel and Cherry, and her siblings, Julia and Maria Tricia. Chuck Edgerton is praying for his son, Jacob, and his mom, Lynette, for salvation. Samantha is praying for Beth. Deborah Hare would like salvation prayers for her unsaved family members. Rita praying for Catholic family members, including her son, Dan. Teresa praying for unsaved family members. Lisa asking salvation prayers for her father, John. Annabal would like a salvation prayer for his unsaved kids. Deborah Milton's son, Billy, needs to get saved. Hap Nightingale is asking salvation prayer for his sons, Jimmy and Zach. Don Huff, Claire, and Virginia, they need to be saved. Norman Merkel is praying for his daughter Kara, granddaughter Ava, son-in-law Stephen Matthews, and for his kid's mother, Lynette Crew. Henrik Larson praying for his parents, Kaijel and Elizabeth, his sister and her spouse, Ingrid and Frederick, and his mom's aunt, Barrett. Um, Let's see, people who need a healing today. We're praying for Annetta, who had a stroke in 2022 for a complete healing. David's mom, Laura, had a stroke. 
Daniel is asking for prayer for healing in his marriage, God's blessing on his kids, recovery from various health issues for his wife and himself, and to find a good Bible-believing church. Marcia Swanson has myelagic encephalomyelitis, which is a neuroimmune disease. George H. has health issues. James Rivette is recovering from addiction and mental health issues and needs a place to live, and we're praying for that. Robert Wiley is battling ALS disease. Jill Puckett is losing her vision. Paul Caulfield needs continued prayers for his battle with diabetes. Ron Alliston has cancer. Uh, Cindy Kettlecamp says, thank you for praying for my daughter, Brooke, with autism. Krista has a tumor in her chest that chemotherapy is not helping. Dan Kane's wife, Roxy, has MS, uh, and we're praying for her and his son, Jonathan. Rob's friend, Mike, has MS. Ida Karulik has cancer. Mark Seals has numerous health issues. Roz has asthma and scoliosis. Tony is blind, has cancer, and his wife is divorcing him. Maddie Luck has Luli body dementia, and her daughter Michelle has neuropathy and fibromyalgia, as does Linda Pippin. Uh, Tracy has severe arthritis in her spine, diabetes type 2, and a fatty liver. Michelle Christian has bone cancer. Melissa B.'s husband, Brian, has stage 3 kidney disease. Ricky Gouda needs prayer for her eyesight. And her daughter, Nortja, needs prayer for complications with her thyroid. KC is a woman with lupus and kidney issues. Jane is asking salvation prayer for her parents and brother and a healing for her husband with a tumor in his spine. Uh, Brooke's sister, Ashley, has MS. Jackie H., please pray God's favor regarding my ex in custody of my son. Vladimir's friend, Katka, suffers from ALS. Dave Evans, praying for Manuela with severe health problems. We are praying for Patty de Blasi, who has lost an uncle, husband, father, and son in the last three years. Stacy is going through a divorce and needs prayer for herself, for her decisions, for her kids, and um, please pray that her husband gets right with the Lord. Uh, Terry Horn would like everyone to pray for her. She has had several strokes and needs a walker. Casey, please keep my husband on your prayer list. He is unsaved and a severe alcoholic. Ladies who are expecting. Our daughter, Megan Burton. Terry Bryant's daughter, Jillian. Shira Shine's daughter-in-law. Christy Ireland. Char's daughter, Miranda. Uh, Sandra Carbonera's daughter, Jordan P. Stephanie Juliana and her sister, Christina, are both pregnant. And... Uh, Brenda Clark says, please pray for my daughter Stephanie's baby, Cassandra, who was born a month ago at 26 weeks. She's getting getting better, but she's getting better very slowly. Uh, So please pray for Cassandra. In the chat room today, Rob says, quick praise report dealing with some issues here and God worked out some amazing unexpected details this morning. Amen. Mike Hensel, uh, please pray for a complete healing for my mom that only God the Father can give. And Jan Lacker says, I see the orthopedic surgeon tomorrow regarding the torn meniscus in my knee. Would appreciate your prayers. Heavenly Father, For all these prayers and um, the unspoken prayers of our hearts, we ask you to work and move as only you can, Father God. And uh, Lord, we ask you to give a healing where a healing is needed. We ask you to work and move, Lord, um, to answer all of these prayers, great and small. And uh, every prayer is important and precious in your sight. And we thank you and praise you and commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I've been seeing some things in the chat room that um, uh, the connection is going in and out. And I apologize for that, but that is not happening on my end. Uh, That would be happening um, on the Internet part. 
So please pray that it gets better because there's nothing that I can do to fix it. Um, I will say that when you go back and listen to this podcast, uh, because it's recorded directly to my computer, if you're having trouble hearing it now, when it's done, you can go back and listen to it in the archive and it will sound hopefully perfectly A-OK. Um, just a reminder that today we are having our unbelievable Cyber Monday sale. This sale started on Blessed Friday, Thanksgiving last week, and um, we ran it all weekend long. And this sale continues. Today is Cyber Monday, where you can go online and get all sorts of things at um, a greatly discounted price. Well, you can do that with the NTEB bookstore today. All you have to do is go to BibleBeliever.com, BibleBeliever.com, and check out the amazing specials that we have today. Um, we have 233 items up for sale. Uh, almost all of the Bibles that we sell, almost all of the commentaries that we sell, D DVDs, CDs, just about everything that you could possibly want as a Bible believer. And uh, today is the last day of this big sale. And uh, we, we, we hope that you will go to BibleBeliever.com and take advantage of this great sale today. Um, and that's about it for the updates. Let's start talking about the American police state that we see in front of us in 2023. This year is almost over. We're about to go into 2024, and I'm telling you, this year is going to be a crazy, crazy, crazy year year. And so we're going to talk about the American police state. Um, we're going to talk about Donald Trump's presidency. We're going to talk about how things are going to be impacted should both of these events come together. Have you ever stopped to wonder what would it be like if Donald Trump becomes president? If he somehow is able to uh, stop himself from going to jail, somehow able to miraculously beat all 91 felony counts that are currently against him in four different states. Can you imagine what a Trump presidency would be like? Now, before you start cheering and yelling and high-fiving, today I'm going to challenge you a little bit because I want you to think I want you to use your brain today. I voted for Trump in 2016. I voted for Trump in 2020. If he is the Republican nominee, I will vote for him in 2024. But what I want you to do today is I want you to use your brain. I want you to think, what would it be like if Donald Trump gets into office and declares revenge on his enemies the same way that the Biden administration has been doing it. Now, the difference between those two things is the Biden administration and the left, they have the complete support of the mainstream media. They have complete support of social media. They control the narrative. So, Joe Biden and Barack Obama and the deep state and the swamp, they can do whatever they want to do. They can do it with impunity. They dare you to catch them. And if you do catch them, they dare you to stop them. And they can get away with all these things because they control everything. If you think that the Democrats don't control everything in America, you are deceived and greatly uh, uh, wrong. 
I couldn't think there for a second. Imminent threat, Arnett. The likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. They own the whole country now, the Taliban. The Taliban are now in complete control of Afghanistan. Complete chaos. How did President Biden get this so wrong? Well, first of all, the mission hasn't failed yet. If this isn't failure, what does failure look like exactly? Biden, you destroyed not Afghanistan, but the world! I don't care if you think I'm Satan reincarnated. <laughs> so that was Joe Biden back in 2021. Um, that's the administration, Barack Obama's third term. Now we're, we are on the cusp of 2024, and what are we going to see? Are we going to see something like this? Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Chief Division Counsel and DOJ have approved a no-not breach. We want the subject to be on display, doing the walk of shame, full visual impact. Any questions? Are we becoming a police state? The government told American citizens they couldn't go to church on Sunday. I've never seen anything like it. It may be the Russia other people grew up in, but not my America. FBI warrant, come to the door now! There's a heavy banging at my door. Open up! It's 15 marked units on my property. I got SWAT in the back of my house. It took a battering ram to my door. 6 a.m. I hear boom, 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 and hear about six to eight military style soldiers with the tallest one of them pointing an automatic rifle at my head. FBI, we have an arrest warrant. Shock you out of sleep, drag you out of your house, half clothes, refuse to give you a warrant, ransack your house. Now I'm facing 15 years in federal prison for doing nothing other than exercising my right to free speech. I had no reason to be attacked. I hope that you remember Matt's name and the role you played in killing him. How did we give the state this kind of power? 9-11 changed everything. We're going to expand the bureau from law enforcement to domestic intelligence. Legal shackles are now off. It used to be Islamic terrorism. That threat has kind of dissipated. Our focus is shifting. They're moving to domestic extremism. It really paints anybody who's right of center. What we need is a person to look at. And then we go find out what crime you did. If you're a pro-life, pro-family Catholic, they define you as radical. The demand for domestic terrorism vastly outstrips the supply. When candidate Trump came down the escalators, the government had a meltdown. We are going to drain the swamp. We'll see about that. You take on the intelligence community. They have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. The Patriot Act and FISA were used against Donald Trump. Google literally rewrote their news algorithm based upon what Trump was doing so that they could get this guy. You just take out the word Russiagate and you put in COVID origins. You take out COVID origins and you put in Hunter Biden's laptop. You take that out and you put in January 6th. It's the replicated play from the deep state and their partners in the media. They're not just deplatforming you. They are trying to throw people in prison. If they're coming for me, they're coming for you. Hands on your head! These are anti-government. We have freedom of religion and freedom of speech! Violent extremists, and they must be dealt with. We can do anything we want. Police State. Exclusively in theaters, October 23rd and 25th. Tickets sold only on policestatefilm.net. And that was the trailer for the new movie Police State by Dinesh D'Souza. And uh, I haven't seen it yet, but it's on my list. I definitely want to see that movie. uh, And you should check it out as well. Uh, But what we're talking about today is we're talking about uh, what would it look like if America, the deep state, and the swamp all meet face-to-face and converge with Donald Trump's third term, Um, second term, (laughs) second term. I'm thinking of Joe Biden and Barack Obama's third term. Uh, You remember what Obama said. 
I, I, I've said this before. I, I, uh, people would ask me, knowing what you know now, do you wish like you had a, sec, a, a third term? Um, and I, I used to say, you know what, if, if I could make an arrangement where um, I had, a, I had a, a stand-in, a front man or front woman, and, and they had an earpiece in, and I was just in my basement in my sweats mm-hmm. looking through the stuff, and then I could sort of deliver the lines, but somebody else was uh, doing all the talking and ceremony, wow. I, I'd be fine with that because I found the work fascinating. Um, I mean, I write about the, the, the uh, even in, in my, on my worst days, I found puzzling out, you know, these big, complicated, difficult issues, especially if you were working with some great people, to be uh, uh, professionally really satisfying. So that was Barack Obama talking about how he would play out his third term. He would want to have a body that he could use as the front man and he could be behind the scenes in a shadow government um, pulling all the levers and making all the decisions and kind of like a Cyrano de Bergerac putting the words into that person's mouth. And that's really what we see with the with the Joe Biden states. So in order for the new world order to fully come in, you've got to get rid of of the United States over in Ireland. They had some troubles just a couple of days ago. They had some riots. They had some migrants doing stabbings of school kids and people like that. And it caused a huge pushback in Dublin, Ireland. I want you to listen to what uh, Green Party Senator Paulette O'Reilly says about the current restriction of freedom. She says it's for the common good. When you think about it, all law, all legislation is about the restriction of freedom. That's exactly what we're doing here, is we are restricting freedom, but we're doing it for the common good. You will see throughout our Constitution, yes, you have rights, but they are restricted for the common good. Everything needs to be balanced. And if your views on other people's identities go to make their lives unsafe, insecure, and cause them such deep discomfort that they cannot live in peace, then I believe that it is our job as legislators to restrict those freedoms for the common good. Now, you remember back during the pandemic when they were restricting everybody's freedoms and they were shutting everybody down, and uh, what did they say in America? That it was for the common good and that we had to have a temporary um, uh, stoppage in many of the freedoms that we enjoy. And so what did they do? They shut down the churches and the synagogues and the places of worship. But they said that the, that the liquor stores were essential to the people. That's the type of country that we live in. The churches can't stay open, but the liquor stores and the place that sells legal marijuana, they are essential um, to society. And we live in a society that is absolutely upside down. And there is no evidence of any kind anywhere on the horizon that this is going to change no matter who gets elected, no matter who comes into power, no matter who takes over. What we are watching is it is all part of the fourth industrial revolution. It is all part of the new world order, the great reset, whatever you call it. You could even call it the UN Agenda 2030 because it's all the same thing. Now, before Donald Trump ran for president, I don't ever recall writing an article about the swamp. And before Donald Trump ran for president uh, back in 2015, 2016. I don't ever recall writing an article about the deep state. What is the deep state? Glad you asked. Listen to this. 
Most Americans hadn't heard the term deep state before Donald Trump's 2016 campaign. Now it pops up regularly in stories about routine government business. Just recently, the president accused his own Justice Department of being part of the deep state. The tricky thing is the deep state is largely undefined. The political Rorschach is highly subjective, truly living in the eye of the beholder. The term typically refers to an intra-government conspiracy. HuffPost puts it this way, Deep State implies a unified force deeply embedded in the Republic that has its own agenda and the means to undermine the decisions of elected presidents and members of Congress. Its power derives from the control of the mechanisms of power and being invisible. Synonym, Shadow Government. Before the 2016 campaign, BillMoyers.com noted the term generally was used in reference to networks of entrenched government officials and various foreign governments. An example here is Pakistan. The country's intelligence agency and the military often operate independently of the country's elected leaders. Coups have been the result. Back here in the U.S., powerful federal bureaucrats certainly try to influence presidents from time to time, including with leaks to the press, writes Politico. But critics of the conspiracy point out their goals are piecemeal not organized across the vast bureaucracy. If by deep state you mean civil servants who keep the government on track as administrations come and go, then yes, it exists. It's debatable, though, to say the least, as to whether the deep state is the threat that right-wing blogger Mike Cernovich described. He said it would turn murderous. That's when Trump will be killed. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill him. They're going to kill everybody. Former Trump strategist Steve Bannon was one of the loudest proponents of the conspiracy theory. He referred to it as the administrative state and made its destruction a priority. Several leaders of the hard right, they've been in lockstep including Congressman Steve King and Trump friend Newt Gingrich. The deep state, the, bu- the professional bureaucrats. And while the deep state concerns are not yet mainstream, some citizens are starting to buy in. An ABC News Washington Post poll out last year showed 28% say the deep state exists and it's a major problem. It was defined as military, intelligence, and government officials who try to secretly manipulate government policy. In the end, it might just come down to this. One person's dedicated career federal worker is another's furtive power usurper. So that was a clip back from 2016 on uh, a liberal, obviously, quoting from the Huffington Post, uh, wanting you to know what the deep state is. Now, what is the deep state? It is the government within the government. Um, Does such a thing exist? It absolutely does exist. And um, back in 1960, Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, warned about a military and industrial complex. And over the last 63 years since he said that, um, everything he warned us about has come true tenfold. Until the latest of our world conflicts, The United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists. So I'm going to stop the former president right there. The potential for misplaced power absolutely exists. Now, 
He said those words back in 1960, one year before I was born. And here we are 63 years, almost 64 years later. And what do we see? We see a military industrial complex that um, is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And the people behind this military industrial complex, they're the ones that are constantly pushing towards war. They're the ones that are constantly ramping up the bombs and the missiles and the armaments. And of course, if you get enough of a stockpile, at some point you're going to want to use those things. You're going to want to use those stockpiles. And there is so much money at stake that they have no problem at all um, taking care of people, getting rid of people, disappearing people. Um, This is par for the course in the deep state in America in 2023. And if you listen to Bible study from last night, we talked about Um, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble and the great tribulation and the the coming short-lived kingdom of the Antichrist. And this world, the major part of this world are people who remain unsaved. If the rapture was to take place right now, most people would still be here. Now, millions and millions and millions of born-again Christians would be um, removed in that event. But there's not millions of people. There's not even hundreds of millions. We're coming up on 9 billion people. If you were to remove 500 million people, that wouldn't really make all that much of a difference. So, what is this world doing? It is preparing itself for the arrival of the Antichrist. That's what this world is doing. Now, Donald Trump wants to become president. He wants to become president really, really badly. And one of the main reasons why Donald Trump wants to become president is he doesn't want to go to prison. Now, I don't know if he is guilty or not guilty, He is charged with 91 felony counts. I can't imagine that they could make up 91 felony counts. Um, I really don't see how anybody gets out of that other than becoming elected president of the United States. And then, of course, that would change everything. Now, if you're just tuning in, This is not an anti-Trump podcast. I voted for him twice. If he's the nominee, I will vote for him for a third time. But I'm just simply asking you today to use your brain and think, why are these things happening? Why does Donald Trump have all this trouble? It might be because of this. After getting the subpoena, you delete 33 thousand emails and then you acid wash them or bleach them as you would say a very expensive process so we're going to get a special prosecutor and we're going to look into it because you know what people have been their lives have been destroyed for doing one fifth of what you've done and it's a disgrace and honestly you ought to be ashamed of yourself Secretary Clinton, i want Martha, to follow let, up on that yeah, i'm going to let, let you talk about it because everything he just said is absolutely false but i'm not oh, surprised really? in the first debate and we in the really, first the debate, audience needs to I calm told down people here that it would be impossible to be fact checking donald all the time i'd never get to talk about anything i want to do and how we're going to really uh, make lives better for people so once again, go to HillaryClinton.com. We have literally Trump. You can fact check him, fact check, fact check him in real time. Last time, he didn't take care of his political enemies. He didn't clean out his cabinet. He didn't get rid of the people who were not friendly um, to his administration. And if you remember back in the first two years of the Trump presidency, uh, there was leak after leak after leak and everything that he was trying to do got leaked to the press. And those leaks were coming from deep inside his own administration. So 
Donald Trump was very, very careless. He made a lot of enemies when he ran for president. He said, he promised that he would drain the swamp and he would get rid of the deep state. And he did not do that. And now in 2023, the deep state and the swamp, they have him pinned against the ropes. 91 felony counts. Is there any possible way that he can get out? Um, Well, and um, they said that he was killed by the police. And then instantly, within minutes, we knew just about everything that you could ever want to know about police officer Derek Michael Chauvin. And um, he was he is a former police officer who was involved in the death of George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, now, I'm not here to contend for whether or not Derek Chauvin was innocent or guilty. Um, that's not really why we're talking about him. But the thing that I want to direct your attention to is that immediately after George Floyd died, however he died, we knew everything about the police officer that was involved in his death. On January 6th, Derek Chauvin was a white police officer who was involved in the death of a black man. Of Ashley Babbitt. Write about it. The police officer's name who was involved in the murder of Ashley Babbitt is Lieutenant Ashley Babbitt was over and done and he was pronounced not guilty. Now, I'm not saying that he's not not guilty. That's not the point of why I'm, I'm bringing up these two instances. But the reason why we're talking about Derek Chauvin and Michael Byrd is that In one of those cases, we knew everything about everybody and we knew it immediately. And in the other case, we were not allowed to know about it. We were not allowed to know the gender, the race, the identity of the police officer that murdered Ashley Babbitt. Why is that? Why didn't we know that man's name as quickly as we knew the name of Derek Chauvin? Why were we not allowed to hear about that trial while the trial was still going on? Why didn't we get a chance to have an opinion on anything that took place in the murder of Ashley Babbitt? But when George Floyd died, that was a completely different story and there were parades and there were monuments and statues and uh, people even praying to George Floyd and uh, Biden pronouncing a, a he wanted to have a national George Floyd holiday and all these different crazy things. The point of what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that we live in a society, we live in a society Um, where we are not allowed to know what's going on if they don't want us to know about it. And there's that book that we sell at the bookstore. It's on sale today. It's called The Prince of the Power of the Air. Um, You might want to go to the bookstore and get yourself a copy of that book. And it talks about the prince of the power of the air from Ephesians and... um, uh, it really lays out the type of nation that we're living the barometer of what the entire left thinks. So take a listen to this. The final battle inside Donald Trump's 2024 presidential campaign of vengeance and martyrdom. The Trump Davidians. That is how Trump ally Steve Bannon sums up a movement that has swallowed whole one of our nation's two major political parties. A movement led by an ex-president currently facing 91 felony counts and on a third run for the White House on a platform of damaging democracy. That quote is from Jonathan Carl's brand new book, Tired of Winning, Donald Trump and the End of the Grand Old Party. It reveals this dramatic collision of efforts to hold the ex-president accountable for his alleged crimes and misdeeds 
and a candidate who has no hesitation stoking the fires of right-wing extremism and sees winning the presidency as the only way to get out of his legal troubles. In an essay in The Atlantic that is adapted from his brand new book, John Carl writes this about the decision by the Trump campaign to hold its very first rally in Waco, Texas, the site of a standoff between far-right extremists and the FBI that ended in dozens of deaths. Quote, shortly after the rally was announced, I asked Steve Bannon, who had served as the CEO of Trump's 2016 campaign and had once again emerged as one of Trump's most important advisors, why the former president would go to Waco for his big campaign reboot. He wasn't coy. Quote, we're the Trump Davidians, he told me with a laugh. As for Trump's comments at that speech, John Carl writes this, quote, This was not a campaign speech in any traditional sense. Trump echoed the themes of paranoia and foreboding that grew out of the Waco massacre. Quote, As far as the eye can see, the abuses of power that we're currently witnessing at all levels of government will go down as among the most shameful, corrupt, and depraved chapters in all of American history, Trump said. The central message of the Trump candidacy was now geared around fending off the criminal cases brought by Manhattan D.A. Alvin Bragg, Special Counsel Jack Smith, and Fulton County D.A. Fonnie Willis. Once again, John Carl writing in The Atlantic, quote, But they weren't coming after Trump's law-abiding supporters. They were coming after Trump. Decades earlier, the presidential candidate, Bill Clinton, told voters that he felt... ...who led Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas... And this is how they are viewing him. On the Stephen Colbert show, we see something very similar. Hey, everybody, look at here. We're back with the author of Tired of Winning, ABC's Jonathan Carl. Now, based on what you know about Trump, um, what, what would the second Trump administration look like? I mean, we have heard from his spokesperson that, you know, those who compare him to a fascist leader like Hitler or Mussolini will have their uh, existence crushed. Utterly annihilated, yes. They, uh, yeah, yes if, so you know, when he gets back into power, uh, that's just an amuse-bouche of what might happen. What, what do you know? What's Project 2025? Uh, first of all, I think January 6th is the beginning of, of a next Trump administration, not the end. Because January 6th happened after the purge of disloyalists. They weren't all purged. So it, Part of getting people that will do what the man wants to be done. But what does he want? To- so you just heard him talk about something called Project 2025. And they have a website for it. It's project2025.org. And um, I just went to that website and this is what it says. The actions of liberal politicians in Washington have created a desperate need and a unique opportunity for conservatives to start on doing the damage the left has wrought and to build a better country for all Americans in 2025. It is not enough for conservatives to win elections. If we are going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, we need both a governing agenda and the right people in place ready to carry this agenda out on day one of the next conservative administration. This is the goal of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project. The project will build on four pillars that will collectively pave the way for an effective conservative administration, a policy agenda, personnel, training, and a 180-day playbook. So, the 2025 Presidential Transition Project is being organized by the Heritage Foundation. So, this is a real thing. This is a legit thing. Um... But the question that we're asking, should Donald Trump become the next president? Should he get this nearly unlimited power? What is he going to do with that power? I think the left knows what he's going to do with that power, which is why they spend so much time trying to stop him. Can they stop him? Well, 
They have put a very formidable personnel. It's just because they think he's smarter this time and he has just caused to really get angry because of what they did to him. They can write all of the Atlantic Monthly and they could, could have really made something out of the fact that Barack Obama had a hot mic expose where he told the president of Russia, you tell Vladimir that I will be flexible on missile defense. That's the security of the United States of America if he gives me space in my last election. And Putin did do that. That's an impeachable offense if a phone call to Ukraine is. So they didn't understand that, that the right could have done that to them. And they understand now the right probably will do that to them for their own survival. And they are scared. They're saying if, if a mega candidate wins and they win the House and the Senate were cooked because they're going to get special prosecutors and they're going to go after the Biden family like they've never gone after anybody. And they're going to find stuff because we know Joe is crooked. And then they're going to go after Mary Garland and they're going to go after Mayorkas and they're not going to stop. And that's why they're scared. And they're going to do any, everybody thinks that the danger passed. They got what they wanted. No, 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 no. You're never going to yeah. see anything like what they're going to do in 2024. All of this could have been reconciled. All they had to do was say Donald Trump should not be president if that's what they believe. And we're not going to do any lawfare. We're not going to try to change the voting laws. We're not going to pack the court. We're not going to let in two states. We're not going to try to abolish the Senate filibuster. We're not going to try to change the uh, voting ID laws. We're just going to play under, under the rules that we have. We don't need $419 million by Mark Zuckerberg infused. We don't need Sam Bankman fried the crook giving us a hundred million. We're not going to go under the radar with George. So we're just going to show you the American people how we think Donald Trump should not be president and we'll have a feral and they can't do that. They don't trust themselves. They think, you know what? Anybody in his right mind would close that border right now. Close the border. Anybody in his right mind would recall all of those DAs that have destroyed these major cities. Anybody in his right mind would not beg the Saudis or the Venezuelans or the Russians or the Iranians to pump oil on the eve of a midterm or drain the strategic petroleum when you have so much natural gas and oil. In the United. Nobody in their right mind would do that. And nobody in their right mind would ever just pull out of Afghanistan without warning, just so Joe Biden can say that on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 or the original October uh, invasion of Afghanistan, I'm the president that got us out. Nobody would do that. And nobody would print $6 trillion when there's a pent up demand post-COVID lockdown and there's a supply chain disruption. So... You're listening to Victor David Hansen saying all these things that nobody would ever do. But the funny thing is, these are all things that the Democrats have done. And like we said earlier, because they control everything, they control the media, they control the news, they control social media, they control the narrative. You think what they want you to think. And if they don't want you to think something, like if they don't want you to know who the cop was that killed Ashley Babbitt, then you're not ever going to be faced with any articles about that. If they do want you to know who the cop that was involved in the murder of George Floyd is, well, then they're going to put that on the front page all day, every day, until everybody knows what they want them to to know. And so this really illustrates this split that we have in America. This this unbridgeable chasm. I can remember back in 2000, 2004 when George um W Bush was running for president and he said that he was going to be a uniter and not a divider. And the country wasn't really all that divided. Um, they were coming off of uh, eight years of Bill Clinton. And um, there were problems, there were controversies, but I don't really remember America being divided. But then in 2008, when Barack Obama became president, that's where the real divisions became apparent. And it had nothing to do with his skin color. It had nothing to do with, 
you know, he was the first black president or anything like that. It had to do with his policies. It had to do with the fact that that um, he attended a church where the pastor would talk about um, God damning America, and uh, his entire background borders on socialism and into communism. And so, when Barack Obama brought all these things to the table to the presidency. It caused a huge split. And now, for the first time since I was in school, and we were told how bad that socialism was, and we were taught about the evils of communism, and now we have a president that is a borderline socialist slash communist bringing these ideals and these principles into the White House. And uh, if you remember the speech that he gave at the Brandenburg Gate in Germany, where he said that he was a citizen of the world. He never liked to say that he was a citizen of the United States. He was a globalist president from start to finish. And Uh, We have had other presidents before who uh, tinkered with globalism, but Obama, in my estimation, is the first president that we ever had that was an out-of-the-closet globalist um, who was also a socialist. And throw that money without any audit or examination of who got it and why and how it was spent but to inflate the economy and ruin it. Nobody would do that. And so they know that. And they know that they can't take that record to the American people. They have a deductive mind because they're ideologue. So they start with a premise that we're for social justice and for equity of result. And so we're moral, morally superior and smarter than anybody else. And therefore, we are entitled to do things that other people don't do. And so if under the cover of COVID and frightening people about COVID, we can change all the voting laws so that 30% instead of voting absentee and early voting shall become 70% in most states with very little audit. Uh- now, let me stop him right there. Do you remember back in 2020 and 2021 and all the stuff was changing because we were going through the pandemic and they changed the laws about mail-in ballots and mail-in voting and everything changed. Now, that's almost three and a half years ago now, if you can believe it. Sometimes I think about that and I'm like, wow, 2020 feels like it was yesterday But it is over three years ago. Well, we are actually in the fourth year since all those things began. And I think that we've forgotten just how much everything was changed during that time period that they had us locked down. And of course, that was the whole reason and the purpose for the lockdowns was that so they could um, change the structure upon which that this country exists. And they were very effective in doing that. And they changed it to a very high degree of the level necessary to authenticate most ballots. They just do all this stuff because they start with the deductive principle. We are better This is the vision, and therefore the following must happen. And if things don't fit the narrative, then they go after the person, they censor it. That's how they work. And if you keep that in mind, then everybody makes sense. And what I'm saying is they go on from one lie to the next. So everybody now knows that Donald Trump, we just discussed it, was impeached for things that Joe Biden got away with. Okay, everybody knows the laptop was authentic. Everybody knows that now. Everybody knows that it would have made a big difference on that debate when Donald Trump said it was. And Joe Biden said, no, 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 51 authorities. Everybody knew that Dushinko and Charles or whatever his name, Dolan and Christopher Steele were frauds. And especially Glenn Simpson and that Hillary Clinton took over an old never Trumper file, inflated it with a million bucks got the FBI on it to hire Christopher Steele as a consultant informant, hid her 
so-called legal expenses, and she was fined and cited for that violation through Perkins Coe, Fusion GPS, the NC, and that f- that file was a fraudulent. It was made up. I said that from the first time I saw it. Everything in it was false, and yet we wasted 22 months and 40 million dollars to know it was obvious. No apology. In fact. Not only no apologies, they got Pulitzer Prize winners, some of the reporters. Every time they give these monstrous lies, there's no apologies. They just, and they, and why should they? Because in their way, they're just narratives. They're postmodern, Foucauldian, Lacan, Derrida, Narada narratives. They were useful. So that's what they looked at. Well, they were useful at the time because when we went through the Mueller investigation, when we went through the laptop, we crippled Donald Trump and therefore we were able to stop him. We had anonymous. Anonymous. He was burrowed deep into the homeland. The DOJ or the FBI is Mussolini-like, or his hounding of individual people at school boards, or the way he conducted the Mar-a-Lago raid is remnant of it's Nazi-like. And I'm just quoting from what they've said. You know what's going to happen to those people? You're going to get Merrick Garland to call up the Pentagon, and they're all going to be slapped with a Code 88 uniform code of military justice, and they're going to be court-martialed for disparaging the commander-in-chief. Trust me, they would in two seconds, and that's not going to happen. First, they're not going to say anything because they're not equally going to apply their standards of correct right. behavior on the part of the... And second all, they're going to say something with Donald Trump because they know that, that the media and the Pentagon are not going to do anything to them now. So you've been listening to that clip from Victor David Hansen. He's an intellectual. He's an author. He's a writer. He's a he 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 talks about politics. Very intelligent man. Very smart man. And um, he is pointing out the incredible disparities between what Democrats are allowed to get away with and what Republicans are allowed to get away with. Now. For as long as America has been a country, there has always been a little bit of the party that's in power taking advantage and taking liberties and giving themselves breaks. And over the years, that's gotten worse. There's no question about it. But that's not really what we're talking about to do that. He promised that he was going to drain the swamp, and he did not do that. And you may not want to hear it, but I want to remind you about something. We all know how we feel about a certain injection from the government. Have to be careful what I say or I won't be able to post this to YouTube. But I want you to Remind yourself that Donald Trump, who's running for president, he considers himself to be the father of the mRNA COVID vaccine. He is proud of that fact. He takes full credit for it. Take a listen to this. I would have put a warning on or something on just that particular vaccine, but I certainly would have deposed it and and gotten front page news all over the world. And then people don't want it. And it probably even affects the others because, you know, there's a big situation with a lot of people don't want to take the vaccine. Well, this played right into their hands. And they want me to do public service messages and everything about everybody taking the vaccine. And look, I guess in a certain way, I'm the father of the vaccine because I was the one that pushed it. You know, to get it done in less than nine months was a miracle. Fauci said it would take three to five years. He thought it was uh, something that just wouldn't be that effective because it would take so long to get. We, I pushed the FDA like they have never been pushed before. I wouldn't exactly say they're, uh, they're in love with me. They have never, this is a very bureaucratic organization. I push them like they've never been pushed before, and that's why we have it. Uh, When they did the pause on Johnson & Johnson, I thought that was a, a very, very stupid thing to do. Would you recommend to our audience that they get the vaccine then? I would. I would recommend it, and I would recommend it to... A lot of people that don't want to get it, and a lot of those people voted for me, frankly. 
So there you have Donald Trump, and he's calling himself the father of the COVID vaccine. And I guess to a certain degree, that is correct. Now, Hillary Clinton, his arch enemy, who he never took care of after he became president, um, you know what she wants? She wants re-education camps and deprogramming for Trump supporters. Very strong partisans in both parties in the past. Uh, and we had very bitter battles over all kinds of things, gun control and climate change and the economy and taxes. But there wasn't this little tail of extremism waving, you know, wagging the dog of the uh, Republican Party as it is today. Mm -hmm. And sadly, so many of those extremists, those mega extremists, um, take their marching orders from Donald Trump, who has no credibility left by any measure. He's only in it for himself. He's now defending himself in civil actions and criminal actions. And when do they break with him? You know, because at some point, you know, maybe there needs to be a formal deprogramming of the cult members, but something needs to happen. And how do you maybe there needs to be a formal deprogramming of the cult members. And this is ha- this is what the left wants to do. And this is what the left is going to do um, if the Democrats are successful. Um, let me see what I haven't played for you. I think I've played just about everything. I think we've talked about just about everything that we needed to talk about today. We're going to wrap things up a couple of minutes early. A lot of people have been saying that the connection was bad. Our upload speed on the modem um, was compromised today. The download is good, but the upload is not good. Uh, and, and that's what's resulting in a little bit of a slower connection. Um, but hopefully when you listen to it in the archives, you'll be able to hear it no problem at all. Just a quick reminder, we are having our Cyber Monday sale at the bookstore. You can go to BibleBeliever.com and you can check it out. And uh, we have 233 items. We have King James Bibles, commentaries, dispensational truth, DVDs, CDs. We have gifts, games, accessories, everything that you need as a Bible believer, we have on sale today. And at the end of today, this is the last sale that we're going to have in 2023. And it likely won't, uh, we won't have another sale until May of 2024 uh, when we have the camp meeting. So if you were waiting for a time to get excellent prices on King James Bibles, commentaries, and everything else that we sell at the bookstore. Today is the last day of the sale, and at midnight tonight, the sale prices will be gone. So make sure that you go to BibleBeliever.com and um, help yourself to some great savings. Everything is a minimum of 20% off, some things as high as 50 percent off. And uh, this is just one of our ways that we say thank you for being a valuable and valued part of the NTEB global family of Bible believers across America and around the world. Uh, And with that, we've come to the end of our time for today. Lord willing, we'll see you back here Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time for another Rightly Dividing King James Bible study. Have a great week, everybody. I wonder if you know him. Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. Well, no barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his soulless supply. Well, he's enduringly strong. He's eternally steadfast. 
He's immortally graceful. He's impurely powerful. And he's impartially merciful. Spontaneously available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Do you know my king? Well, my king is a king of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a gateway of glory. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Do you know him? Well, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm come to tell you, the heavens of heaven cannot contain him, let alone a man explain him. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. He always has been, and he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You can't even teach him, and he's not going to resign. That's my king. Yeah. Do you know him? He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the populace. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. That's my king. Yeah.